There we go. So we're recording now, and we can we can get into our into our agenda. So Malcolm Wade, welcome to the the conference, the Threshold Conference, where we're going to talk about the the future, uh, the threshold future, or rather threshold as a future. Thank everyone else for attending uh, today's uh, meeting. I understand Diane will join us shortly. So uh, Wade, you've got a presentation you'd like to take us through to kick things off. Would you like to do that? Uh, yes, please. I have been thinking, as I have, on this subject for many years uh, and writing, and I want to stick my neck out and ask a question that I don't see other people asking, and I think it's rather important. So, where are we? Oh, there we are. That'll do. I won't go into actual presentation mode because this is much more flexible. I want to ask a question of whether the nuclear option is friend or foe. Now, the immediacy of the pandemic and the action of a powerful autocrat has caught the world opinion off guard. Disasters and accidents reported in the media are not just sources of interest and stimulation, they're matters of survival affecting everybody. Likely existential threats today form a tangled knot. Epidemics, economics and political instability, climate change and the loss of energy supplies. But does nuclear war belong in the same list? It is usually assumed that the use of nuclear weapons by anybody is unthinkable. Indeed, reference to the nuclear option in everyday speech has come to mean just such an unconscionable endpoint in other contexts as well. War of any kind is to be avoided, a nuclear war in particular. But is unqualified horror a sensible attitude to the nuclear option in the light of all that we know? Should this taboo that dates from the Cold War still determine our thinking today? In the context of the Ukrainian war, at least, these have become significant questions. Treating a threat as unthinkable is ineffective, even dangerous. Indeed, never to have thought or prepared for the unexpected is a recipe for panic if it happens. The unthinkable Titanic sank because the crew had been told that it was unthinkable. And of course, thresholds are the answer to just how dangerous things are. When in 1931, Churchill wrote prophetically in the Strand magazine that the power of nuclear was a million times that of the fossil fuel that powered the Industrial Revolution, he was right. If such an energy is released in the blast and fire of a weapon, it is fatal to the majority of those within a mile or two, depending on its size. Those much further away are not affected, nor are those who come to the site months and years later. The effect is similar to the destruction by conventional explosives and firestorm of Tokyo, Hamburg or Dresden, or Chechnya, Aleppo and Mariupol, except that it may come from a single device. Nuclear radiation plays a very minor role in the mortality from a nuclear explosion. This is a, a surprise for many people. That is not what we have been told. Where does the truth lie? Why has it been hidden? A great deal has been learnt about the effect of radiation on life in the past 120 years. When radiation was discovered by Mary Curie and others in the last years of the 19th century, they studied its effect on life intensively. Consequently, high doses were used successfully 
within a few years to cure cancer, as they still are today. Millions of people have reason to be thankful as a result. As with any technology, much was learnt from accidents too. But by 1934, international agreements had been reached on the size of a safe radiation dose. 0.2 grams per day. In modern units, 2 milligrams or millisieverts per day. In 1980, Lauriston Toller, who died in 2004, born in 1902, the Dian of radiation health physicists, affirmed in a lecture that nobody has been identifiably injured by a lesser dose, a statement that remains true today. At first sight, it is strange that ionizing radiation, which with its power easily able to break the critical molecules of life, should be harmless in low and moderate doses. And it does, and it does indeed break them. But living, but living tissue fights back because it has evolved the ability to do so. That's what being alive means. Since the natural radiation and radioactivity in the Earth's environment was even greater in the past than it is today, life would have died out long ago if it had not developed multiple layers of defense. These act within hours or days by repairing, replacing molecules and cells too. Control of these mechanisms was devolved to the cellular level long ago. And it is a mistake for human regulations to try to micromanage the protection already provided by nature. So although the details of natural protection and how it works are still being understood better today, the effectiveness of the safety it provides were known and agreed already in 1934. But then in the 1950s, mid 1950s, human society lost its nerve. What went wrong? as I do, the 1950s was a time of military threat abroad, spying, secrecy and mistrust at home. In America, it was the era of Senator Joseph McCarthy, when all sorts of innocent people were accused of being communists and Soviet agents. In the aftermath of World War II and the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nuclear radiation was seen as a no-go area supposedly too difficult to understand, except for the exceptionally bright, and off limits to everybody else. After World War II, we'll just move on to... After World War II, a vast industrial military complex continued to develop test and stockpile weapons to the horror of large sections of the populace worldwide. Huge popular marches and large political demonstrations attempted to prevent this work. There was no robust evidence to substantiate public fear, but in the prevailing atmosphere and distrust and secrecy, that was not necessary. The cause of concern was the irreparable damage to the human genome from a radiation that may not only may affect not only those irradiated but all subsequent generations. The tentative prediction was made by Hermann Muller, a Nobel Prize winner, without any evidence. The ghoulish story was eagerly adopted by the media as fact, as the attached excerpt from the popular magazine Life, dated May 1955, and explicitly quoting Miller, shows. This was widely believed at the time 
by public authorities and even by other Nobel laureates who should have asked for more evidence. The, the ease with which small quantities of radiation can be detected makes it possible to measure exposures many thousands times smaller than the level accepted as safe in 1934. So in their distrust and fear of nuclear empowered authority, popular pressure demanded that life be spared all exposure to any radiation at all. In a vain attempt to calm popular opinion, safety regulations were enacted at a level as low as reasonably achievable, Alara. For the public, this was similar, was set to be similar to the natural radiation at a fraction or a fraction of it at about 0 0.001 millisieverts per day. The level was set as a precaution, they said, by national authorities, advised and coordinated by a phalanx of international committees under the United Nations. Lacking any scientific rationale, these authorities covered their backs by adopting a bogus theory that states any exposure to radiation is dangerous and any radiation damage accumulates throughout life, so ignoring the natural protection provided by evolution altogether. This theory called LNT is not supported by evidence and over lives on a naive and improper use of mathematics. Adherence to current regulations based on Alara, is based on Alara and LNT has caused serious social and environmental damage. For instance, the response to the accidents at and Daiichi. International bodies and committees unlike individuals, stick rigidly to their terms of reference. They don't change their minds. So the International Commission for Radiological Protection still supports ALARA and LNT today and advocates protection, which is not necessary except in extreme cases. A reasonable person would then ask, what about the extreme cases? And that's what I want to ask now. The supposition made by Muller that an exposure to radiation can alter your genetic code and this can be passed on to your offspring is contradicted by the medical records of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, their children and grandchildren. The medical history of 86,911 survivors and their children and grandchildren have been followed since 1950 and published. As a result, nobody today maintains that there is any evidence for such inheritable, inheritable genetic changes. This is confirmed in animal experiments and was accepted even by the ICRP in 2007. <coughs> so Muller was wrong. Incidentally, he was also wrong about the evidence for which he received the Nobel Prize in 1946. A second concern for the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was that radiation caused cancer, including leukemia, in later years. Inevitably, some survivors have died from these diseases, but their numbers can be compared but with those who received no dose because they were too far away. Some 68,000 uh, of the survivors received a dose less than 100 millisieverts, and these showed no evidence for extra cancers. Between 1950 and 2000, altogether there were 10,127 deaths from solid cancers and 296 from leukemia. These were 480 and 93 deaths, respectively, greater than those expected on the basis of those not irradiated. 
The total number of these extra deaths, 573, is not small, but is less than half a percent of those who died of the blast and fire from the bombs. Furthermore, it is only a third of the number of deaths reported as caused by the inept evacuation at Fukushima Daiichi, an accident in which nobody died from radiation at all. Evidently, fear of radiation is far more dangerous even than its actual following the bombing of two major cities. But it's important to examine more evidence to, to see whether it is co whether, whether it co co corroborates this conclusion. Then also we should understand better how it is that human society could have persisted with such a gross misunderstanding of nature for 70 years. For a new vaccine, a convincing demonstration of its effect, of its efficiency and safety comes from a blind experiment. The same has been done for radiation with large groups of animals. Two identical groups are taken. One is irradiated and the other not. And the difference after days, months and years is reported. Exposure to radiation every day throughout life confirms the existence of a threshold of two millisieverts per day for additional cancers or other life-shortening diseases. Just the same as was found in 1934. At Chernobyl, 28 firefighters died of acute radiation syndrome in a short time, 27 from more than 4,000 millisieverts and one from between 2,000 and 4,000 millisieverts. There were 15 deaths from thyroid cancer, but opinion is technical opinion is divided actually on these. Other cases of ill health were related to severe social and mental disturbance. The effect of being told, you have been irradiated and you are leaving home now, is like voodoo or a medieval curse. It confuses, depresses and causes illness, both physical and mental and social health. Notably, a thriving as shown in wildlife programs, but they have not seen the horror videos about Chernobyl and have not lost their homes. Entertainment and excitement are important emotional exercises that prepare us to face real danger, but it can be difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. The placebo effect is a well-known uh, is well known. That is when genuine health benefits are found by patients who think they have been treated when they have not. The nocebo effect is the inverse. That is when people who have not been harmed are told that they have been and then suffer real symptoms. The same happened at Fukushima. There was family breakup, uh, cases of drugs and drink and uh, serious disruption, but there was no, but for no reason. In some places in Iran, southern India and Brazil, the level of natural radiation is much higher than normal. But these inhabitants are not frightened and show no increase of cancer or other illness, rather the reverse. The next 100 years, with better scientific education, the language should change and reference to the nuclear option becomes shorthand for the preferred outcome. In medicine, that has been accepted for a long time. The medical doses received by healthy tissue in a course of radiotherapy are high, about a thousand milligrams every, every day for five days a week for several weeks. Such a whole body dose 
all at once would be fatal in a few days. Radiologists ensure that even this huge dose does, often, does not often cause secondary cancer. In fact, radiation is known to be a rather weak carcinogen. Right now, we should not allow ourselves to be blackmailed by a threat to use nuclear weapons. The bark of the nuclear option is worse than its bite. And as we know much more about this dog than many realize. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Wade. Very, very informative. Let me just get the views back. So, do you want to, the presentation... I know it, 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 it's the first time that I have thought it apt to actually uh, grasp this nettle. Uh, but I hope, intend to do this in public in the next few weeks, and I very much want to get feedback from this uh, meeting as to what people, how people react to it. It's a very powerful statement. Diane, you're a bit Sorry, my throat's just a bit funky. Uh, good day, Professor Allison. Let me try that one more time. Um, an interest, uh, just a comment that, that you made uh, about where, with this image that we have here about genetic problems for future generations. Um, Professor Jerry Halloway the, published a study in Nature which basically went off and looked at the effects of the um, cleanup crew. I can't remember what the, what the Russians termed it, at Chernobyl, the people who clean up after the accident, and uh, what their genetic problems were faced after they were exposed to extremely high levels of radiation. And ultimately, the result of the study was nothing. It was one of, it's one of those weird studies where, you did, where, where she basically went out to prove nothing. And it comes down to the same thing which you said earlier, is that radiation is this giant dog with this incredible bark, but it's got a weak butt. Uh, and I just wanted to make that comment that even in, you, you recited studies from Hiroshima, she studied sharks, sharks studies from uh, Chernobyl, and it basically correlated with each other. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for that. No, Wade, very impressed with the with the presentation. I think it's a timely that that kind of information is shared. Malcolm, would you like to add to that, or to have uh, alternative view or comments on that? Um, I was just, it would, it always help. I always find it helpful if I can focus at the beginning of any of these processes of um, whose behavior are we trying to change and what behavior change in those people are we trying to effect? Um, and I'd be interested to hear from Wade as to what his answers to those questions are. Whose behavior needs to change in this sort, in this arena? Uh, an underlying question is why, why isn't their behaviour the behaviour we'd like to see at the moment? Um, and how will what we're doing contribute to that behaviour change? Because to me, this is all about behaviour change. That's what we need to achieve through this. And just, uh, uh, just be interested in whose who's behaviour he's seeking to change through this work and how he's going to try to affect that change. These are very good questions. Where to begin? Uh, our predecessors have concreted in this fear of radiation into all the way up to the United Nations. Uh, and committees, the, the Commission for Radiological Protection is not and uh, I've met and discussed with the chairman of the International Commission for Radiological Protection, uh, they're not about to change their mind because 
that's what it says on their door, radiological protection. So the idea that most of the people who they're protecting don't need protection, uh, they are very resistant indeed to... Uh, um, so those people are difficult. I'm glad to say that my doctor, uh, who is the kind of person who ought to be able to understand what I'm saying, he concentrates on his patient's health. And it's just as well that the medical profession don't, as a whole, embark on, uh, on into, into politics. But they are a group of people who have every reason to understand uh, from the traditions of Mary Curie uh, what is true. The young people, actually, because the situation is not very complicated, I haven't shown you anything very complicated, uh, and even I'm writing it up uh, in a longer format, I don't need to say anything terribly sophisticated. Um, the young people can understand. Uh, unfortunately, Greta Thunberg doesn't understand because she doesn't understand the science. But that kind of voice, which did address the, uh, the simple science, uh, could get through. So who? Young people. People of my generation, or dare I say, uh, probably most of the listeners, uh, it's not... Uh, people are only going to understand when their children come home from school and the parents say, what did you learn today? And the children say innocently, we learned that radiation is safe and this is why. And their children, their parents, will listen to them the way they won't listen to politicians. Um, so it's going to take a long time. It's going to take much longer than it is to going to be to develop the reactor that people are talking about. That, that done, and that's going to take take a, a, a few years. But in five or ten years, we will start to see see uh, reactors, and uh, they may be uranium reactors, they may be thorium reactors. Uh, some will still be uh, uh, water cooled, but that's not the point. So. Quick answer, single answer to your question is the young people. But that means that we've got to get to the teachers. Otherwise they won't. And the media, who are not exactly leaders in tackling something like this. I, I've had a go. I, will have to go. I certainly want to uh, explain to you just now, uh, I want to throw it into uh, the media uh, and see what, see what happens. But such things usually end up uh, in the, on the cartoon floor. Can I, can I change the subject slightly and, uh, or does somebody want to say something on what I've said? My connection seems to be playing up. Uh, Malcolm, just, just going back, Malcolm, to what you were, you were asking, how does, that, how does that feel for you on, on the, who we want to change and how we want to do it? Or the belief, the belief system we want to change? I mean, I, I think from where we are, I'm just to widen the comments a little bit. I, my impression is that the the global attitude towards nuclear power oh, yes. and it's becoming more positive 
And so now is the time really to be pushing the advantages rather than getting too hung up about the the areas where the public thinks there are drawbacks. I think if there was a focus on Africa, for example, for this afternoon, um, last week it reached 48 degrees in Tunis. Uh, Morocco has been facing 45 degree temperatures this week. Uh, there are fires right the way across North Africa. Um, the, uh, we have the uh, hot situation prompted by uh, Putin, but, but, but not this week. I'm sure we remember there was a fossil fuel crisis before the Ukraine uh, invasion. And quite frankly, you've got Germany, which is increasingly just making a fool of itself in the international community of having these five excellent nuclear reactors and yet preferring to close those down and extend the. The recording, Jeremiah, you start off with the recording. Yes, I'm back. Uh, Malcolm, please continue. Right, got it. Okay. So, at the moment, the, the, the I think there are increasing numbers of politicians around the world who do get the point on nuclear and want to, uh, and therefore what we need to do is not actually persuade them, is to give them the arguments to use about nuclear. And the arguments to use about nuclear are not really about the no threshold policy. The arguments are really around energy security, economics, uh, climate change, uh, all of the reasons why I think everybody uh, in, in this room and elsewhere, uh, uh, colleagues elsewhere, um, ultimately, yeah, what got us into supporting nuclear in the in the first place. I think in terms of people whose behaviour needs to change that, the focus needs to be a whole harvestment, and that means getting to the advisors of the political establishment, the, depending on how each country organises it, the civil servants, uh, the special advisors that uh, political advisors that many uh, elected politicians uh, have. Uh, I think there are a couple of barriers that we need to take very seriously in the terms of the perceptual relationship between what people think regulation does for them and the reality that, that Wade has so clearly uh, outlined uh, at the moment. One would hope that the starting point for any regulatory structure was that it ended up doing it only takes the most cursory glance at what happened after Fukushima to demonstrate that the uh, regulations around so-called radiological protection after Fukushima vastly more harm than good, immeasurably more harm than good. You've really got to take it seriously. You've really got to go to the 10 if you, if, if you really want to hurt somebody with radiation. Low level radiation is really bad at doing that. But radiological protection can be lethal. Uh, and part of our aim must be how do we protect people from radiological protection. Uh, but in terms of the public view, of course, uh, and I'm talking here about the intelligent layperson who, generally speaking, takes a very sensible view of life, but isn't necessarily particularly well informed about these things. I think there are kind of two ideas that are very unhelpful. One is that nobody overdoes regulation, that actually the problem in the regulatory sphere, generally speaking, is that there isn't enough regulation and companies get away with things. Now, in the UK at the moment, we have a, we're just coming to the end of a uh, more than three year public inquiry process around a dreadful fire at a tower block called Grenfell Tower in London. Uh, just over six, uh, just over five years ago, uh, where it is very clear from that inquiry that the both the principle and the practice of regulation was woefully inadequate in protecting the 77 people whose lives were lost in that fire and the many, many others whose lives were destroyed in that fire. That the we had a government which was uh, anti the concept of regulation and had a policy that if you want to introduce a new regulation by the end of their reign, you have to. Uh, remove three other regulations from the statute book before you're allowed to introduce one, uh, and an industry which was extraordinarily effective at getting round regulations. 
and uh, putting in what was tragically proven to be an absolutely lethal system, uh, despite regulation that was clearly on, on the surface anyway, designed to prevent that from happening. And if we look at the uh, many examples around the world of where water quality is being destroyed by uh, people getting around regulations, uh, chemical poisoning, um, the whole area of emissions as being part of this. I think that for the intelligent layperson looking around, they would not automatically presume that the main problem in life is that we don't have enough regulation or that it is not applied uh, effectively uh, in, uh, or, or that it's applied too rigorously uh, and therefore stumps things. So unfortunately, for the reasons you know, Wade has said that the LNT industry grew up really as a result of this uh, devilish triumvirate of the, uh, um, the anti-nuclear weapons movement in the early 60s, which correctly saw that if it could establish the idea that any level of radiation was harmful, that was a very powerful weapon against atmospheric uh, atom bomb testing, which was the main focus at that point, of a growing professionalized research establishment that was still in the transition from uh, the kind of post-enlightenment view of research as being something that wealthy gentlemen did uh, as, a, uh, as, as a hobby alongside just almost to keep them out of uh, trouble towards something that was being professionalized and was gaining large amounts, growing amounts of government grant. And this was perceived as an area where government uh, could be persuaded if it could be worried enough to put a huge amount of research establishment and huge grants from the Rock Foundation, but from uh, fossil fuel industry uh, uh, interest, which could clearly see the advantage of, of killing off the, the growing nuclear power wave at that time when it came to promoting their own financial interests. So that's how it grew up. And, and I think we, we recognize that and it's worth talking about that because it's quite a human story. It's an interesting human story, but it has led to an anomaly where we go over the top with regulation over radiation, where generally speaking, we get nowhere near the top in regulation with many other things, which of course are far, far more lethal because we're starting off from having to somehow persuade the politicians involved and the others involved that this is not a typical case of an industry trying to avoid regulation for its own evil purposes, but a recognition that the regulation itself is actually deeply counterproductive. Uh, and the other one, I think, is this concept of uh, of erring on the side of caution. Now, I've no doubt at all that the Japanese authorities post Fukushima, in leaders that followed Fukushima, felt they were erring on the side of caution, felt they were taking measures that might be a bit over the top, but it was worth it because of the benefits that would flow from them. Now, in actual terms, to err, if you wanted to err on the side of caution at Fukushima, you would have done nothing whatsoever. You would simply have left the situation to run precisely. It would still have been an error because the immediate evacuation around the plant was very sensible in terms of uh, allowing the operators to do whatever was necessary, vent radioactivity into the environment if they needed to without worrying about nearby people. So I'm not arguing for doing nothing there. There were some very sensible things to do. But to go to the extent where a, a decade later, people were still excluded from their homes and more people in, in Fukushima prefecture had died as a result of the response to Fukushima than had died a as a result of the earthquake and the tsunami, let alone the, the, the plant itself, which, which killed exactly nobody. Um, that's not erring on the side of caution. And we do need at some point to address the idea that too much regulation can be just as lethal, maybe even more lethal than not enough regulation. And I think if we can establish those two ideas, and they are difficult ideas to establish because they're kind of anti-common sense. The, the, the rational layperson who takes an interest in the world doesn't see very many examples of things being that way round, whereas they see plenty of examples of big businesses getting away with murder because the regulatory regime is not robust enough to, to stop them. But there's a need, I think, for a, for a social discussion around regulation, what role regulation plays, and certainly the, the, the scientific points that, that Wade made. But unless the, the underlying message can be addressed 
first, then there's a danger that people will simply reject the science because it is so far from fitting in with their rational common sense interpretation of the world they see around them. And Fukushima is a really excellent, sadly and tragically, but a really excellent uh, example of, of all of that. So I think in talking to, and if we are focusing on Africa as an example, where um, very little apart from South Africa at the moment, nuclear is, is really coming onto the agenda, but is coming onto the agenda in many, in many uh, African countries, as we know. It's a very good time at this point to say, look, nuclear power has all these extraordinary advantages uh, for Africa, particularly if you're generating electricity using nuclear and you've got plenty of uranium in, in Africa, then uh, your own resources that might be attractive for other countries, you'll be able to earn foreign currency with that and, and, and you know, international earnings with that. Uh, it will give you a secure source of power. You'll be able to play your part in reducing greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and you won't fall into the trap that, frankly, Europe has of becoming over-dependent on fossil imports from relatively unstable areas of the world. Uh, but you're in danger of queering the pitch over this if you make the same mistakes over regulation that have been made in the, in the uh, developing world. Because the developing world, which kind of thought, well, we could afford to go over the top with regulation, uh, because we're rich enough and, there's, uh, and, and things are going okay, uh, actually has caused untold, uh, well, I mean, it's made the whole thing against climate change much, much more difficult than it need have been if we continued to build nuclear at the rate that we were in the 70s and 80s and, and, and 90s. So in terms of the, um, the human bits, the first point I think must be to try to create the circumstances in which people are inclined to accept the science that, that Wade is, is putting forward. Because I fear if we just go in with the science and say, look, all of your common sense is wrong because this is the science, there's a real danger that people will simply reject the science uh, hook, line and sinker, not through irrationality or stupidity, but for actually the directly opposite reason that the rational and the intelligent person would think this is so vanishingly unlikely compared to the way I see the rest of the world behaving, that I, I can't put any credibility in those who are spreading the message. And at that point, clearly, the whole thing uh, falls, to, fall, falls to the ground. So summing up with vision makers within Africa, I th think they are the, you know, the, the behavior that we want to influence is decision makers in Africa saying, we're not gonna fall for this no threshold uh, claptrap. Even if we accept the no threshold model, uh, the risks we're talking about are negligible up to a pretty high level, but actually we're not even going to accept the no threshold model itself. It's just that there's practically nothing in our environment that follows a linear no threshold model of harm. Why should radiation, which for heaven's sake, we've evolved to take account of, you know, radiation, we'd expect much less than anything else to have a linear no threshold model because it's ubiquitous. You could imagine maybe for some of the new risks that we have come up with that we haven't met in an evolutionary sense, maybe some of those might follow a low, no threshold model. I'm not aware of anywhere we've got any evidence for that. But, but it's, it's just counter common sense that radiation follows that level. And so instead of, and we want these enormous benefits that nuclear power now is so, it's so clear for anyone of goodwill to energy prices were low and there was a glut of, of gas and greenhouse emissions were sort of edging down because of the switch from coal to gas. Then the nuclear advantages maybe weren't quite as clear as they are now. But goodness me, they're, they're there in black and white now, and they are being accepted in black and white. If you look at public perception, even in Germany, uh, where it seems a clear majority of people in Germany now want these five reactors to be saved and, and to be extended, and for Germany to do its bit uh, in the fight both against climate change and the fight against Mr. Putin. Um, so even in Germany, the, the uh, the public is in some ways ahead of its politicians around this. But there are other areas where the politicians are very sound on this. And for them, it's a matter of saying, if you want to achieve what you want to achieve, then don't fall down this black hole of no threshold argument. Once we've established that emotional argument, and therefore they have a clear vested interest 
then I think the science can then follow up and support in a very strong way uh, that. But the initial discussion, I think, has to be on the wider issue of nuclear. It has to be teasing out and finding where the allies are in each country that's looking at nuclear. Uh, and I don't think they're hard to find, but, but we need to find those out. And it's having the discussion with them and kind of just sharing the experience of the Northern Hemisphere and, and, and perhaps uh, the US and, and Western Europe in particular of just what enormous damage to our prospect of getting through this climate emergency has been done by this misunderstanding of the science and the manipulation of the science by vested interests of various sorts. And so for me, that's the behavior to influence is bolstering the people who are on our side and neutralizing the people who may not be in those areas of providing the wider arguments in favor of nuclear power. And by doing so, creating the background against which the science around the linear no threshold model is more likely to be accepted because it then fits in line with the emotional requirements of those who are talking to, rather than as it is at the moment, somewhat standing against it because of the history of poor regulation in other industries, uh, not just history, the present uh, of poor regulation in other industries that sadly we see in too many places. So it's worth giving a bit of thought to saying, what if they're absolutely determined to adopt the no threshold model? But for the moment, I think, the, the, the communication job is very much around the helping the, to, to cement the pro-nuclear case in everyone's minds. And so from that point of view, there becomes a psychological vested interest in resisting the no threshold model, rather than at the moment, a kind of psychological vested interest in accepting it. A good point, Malcolm, and actually uh, accepting it by default as well, as you pointed out, misunderstanding or manipulation of the science has been going on for a while. And I'm a, Wade, you mentioned a very good point before, the ICRP in 2007, you said that they acknowledged that there was no, uh, no damage or was at the point you made. Uh, the fact that that was made, sorry, Wade, do you want to clarify that, what you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, I, I do actually. What, what they actually said was, if they wouldn't dare say there isn't a risk. Uh, what they did was they said it was a tenth of what it was, what they had said before. So in 2007, they revised their risk form, hereditary uh, damage down by a factor of 10 compared with what it was in 1990. So essentially they pulled back from that altogether. But what worries me, and I don't disagree with anything that Malcolm has said, but, and the but is that if we go ahead in this direction, first of all, that nuclear is going to stop climate it's, it's going to be what we do. Uh, but uh, the other problem is that if Africa or, or any other country come to Lawrence and says, yes, we want nuclear power. We're going to be with the cost being done by the regulations. And they're not going to be able to afford it. And they shouldn't afford it. <coughs> Somehow, we've got to get the the cost down, and there's going to be plenty of people interested in an intellectual property in the first world who won't want it to go down because that's where the profit is. Selling uh, nuclear power to Africa at the right price should be a bargain basement. Of it should be very, very cheap. But we saw with the vaccines that the first world is very good at solving a way that we're going to be able to solve our problems. So it's the need for the likes of Africa.
I think it will, but I think it's got a long way to come down. And we've got to start rolling nuclear power stations off the slipways of the world somehow, uh, the way the Americans did with uh, liberty ships during, and giving them free. And other countries should have nuclear power, because otherwise we're not going to be able to cut back uh, accelerating effect of climate change. So uh, it's getting the, it's the regulations and the costs that have got to be got down. Of course, there are very good examples of what education and thinking about it does. Japan has suffered very badly from tsunamis and earthquakes. Don't talk about Fukushima. Go to a school and they all know about tsunamis and earthquakes and they are taught about them and they, they are helmet, uh, hard, hel hard helmet standing up in the, in the changing rooms. The kids know what to do. So when the tsunami came, in March 2011. They knew what to do about that. They'd been taught about it. 20,000 of them died and the radiation came and they didn't know anything about it and nobody died and society went into a panic. So education, education, education is the, of the young people is where we have to go. Easier said than done. Yeah, and it's a very, that, that, that can't be the immediate priority. The immediate priority must be those who are in positions of influence already. And the I'm a bit scared. I always point out that if you look at the graph of the the the, the UK used to have these big the UK nuclear uh, community used to have these big public education uh, programs. Schools, I do think, is different. I agree, but public education program they used to spend a fortune on it, and then they went bust around the year 2001 when British Energy. Uh, went broke um, and they stopped doing these public perception things and the the favorability of nuclear power has grown continually ever since the <laughs> industry stopped trying to educate the public about it. Oh, I and, don't and think I don't... the industry is the right because they have the interest in the intellectual property of the uh, that that's the problem there I mean you see it well you've seen the the biggest thing in I'm not interested in the biggest crane in the world above Hinkley Point. We want small reactors. Uh, those are not so into, uh, to business, unfortunately. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, they, I, we, we, from my view, certainly, is we've got to be very careful about querying the pitch from the because the problem oh, yeah. I use it, no, building them at a very good cost, and that's yeah. partly because their project management is better but it's also because they're financing we finance NBC on the worst possible imaginable uh, structure where all of the economic risk was put on the shoulders of this uh, of the entity building it edf in effect um and edf not unreasonably said okay you're gonna have to pay us a fortune to manage that economic risk and uh, with power prices where they are now uh, EDF will be <laughs> laughing all the way to the bank on the basis of this of this project. If you just take a, and we are developing models, uh, regulated asset based model at the moment, that will share the risk and therefore share the mean that the rate of return on the project comes down more reasonably. But it's not it's not a million miles away from the truth to say that the cost of nuclear power is just proportional to the rate of return demanded on the capital. It's a bit of an exaggeration. Yeah. But it's not it's not all that much. So. So, uh, and there is going to be a need for big reactors, not least because we can build them now. The small reactors are extremely exciting, but they emerged in the 1950s. And if they were that easy, chances are, in, in my sort of rather naive way, we'd probably have been using them all over the world by now if they were problem free. Uh, we know from, from wind and solar, which were invented in the late 19th century, that things can have a long latency period and then be very successful. But, uh, I feel more comfortable when there was a couple of hundred small modular reactors operating nicely around the world and we can actually kick the wheels with them. And even in those circumstances, well, Africa might well be a very good example where small modular reactors are very fitted to the grids. 
But in those areas like Europe, which have super grids, then huge point forces are still pretty effective <laughs> of, of organizing a power system. So I think there's a day between big reactors and small reactors, and that's just playing into the hands of the of the opposition, I think. Yeah, good point, Mark. I'm good point, Wade. And bringing you back to the conversation with Africa, I mean, the the opportunity we see is that we have countries that have not a uh, an existing industry, either in fossil fuels or in nuclear. So we have a great opportunity to educate uh, children, to educate young people, to also to educate the uh, the people who are the regulators, the legislators, rather legislators is a key one. And I think we're at a very good point, given the, the amount of nuclear um, support that's happening around the world, the failure of Germany, the obviousness of, of Germany's uh, next step is obvious to everyone, even to the Germans. And that's, I think it's just a matter of time before they take that step. And Malcolm, you made a very good point that the LNT has been seen as isolation, in isolation from the rest of the industry. And we haven't and the industry hasn't been uh, doing a good job at either addressing that directly or even inclusively, like just bringing that, um, not bringing the education level up, but not making a big song and dance about it, which is what the, uh, the LNT pundits tend to do. So from the perspective of a new country that doesn't have uh, an LNT embedded into it, into its psyche, uh, except perhaps from Hollywood movies, the the opportunity we have is to introduce threshold, threshold radiation management, uh, and then to deal with the the consequences of that, which you know, from our side are all positive. So we're talking about reduced capital costs. We're do, talking about uh, focus on technology adoption rather than technology shielding. So that's one way to look at it. Uh, and it also means that, Malcolm, we can either have large or small uh, machines, depending on the, the requirements at that particular location. Um, we have places like Lagos in uh, Nigeria, they'll be, I think they're already at 100, 100 million. No, they'll be 100 million in like 20, 30 years as a city. You know, so a huge concentration of people, unlike anything on the planet. So they're going to need large machines, large uh, nuclear reactors. Uh, but you've got lots and lots of opportunity across Africa for 10 to 100 megawatts, which are far more uh, suitable in those locations. And then, so I see Africa being a very, very good example of how to do it the right way, particularly if we start the conversation with threshold management. Uh, obviously, that's something we want to do uh, wherever we can. Um, Diane, you're actually in South Africa. So would you like to comment on what you see with the uh, with the, the nuclear industry in South Africa? I know it's, it's very, very mature in South Africa. But how would you think that we could get threshold adoption happening in South Africa? That's an interesting question. Um, the Right now, we've got, uh, I would say, two major opposing forces in South Africa. Uh, the government itself, led by uh, the Minister of Energy, Gwede Mandashe, is all in favour of nuclear energy. And the problem with South Africa is that the previous administration handled nuclear in a corrupt way. I uh, don't want to go more into that, but that's where it is. So from uh, an official viewpoint, that's not really the biggest stumbling block from a South African perspective. Um, when it comes to other things like where the, the limits lie and stuff like that, the, the regulation in South Africa follows the world example. So if the, the NRC in the US says the limit is 0.2 uh, millisieverts, and that's what's going to be here in South Africa. So we pretty much follow. But if we give clear evidence, if we show the benefits of it, 
then that would actually, I can definitely see how the LNT, what Professor Allison was talking about, can go into effect. This is also being pushed on by another front. Um, I wanted to make this comment earlier, but I guess now it's a good time. Um, with what Malcolm also said, and the cost of nuclear energy, is that it, a calculation was done by an economist that says if we were doing reasonable um, safety measures on the nuclear power plant, we can actually reduce the capital cost by 90%. It's significant. All of these things are well established here in South Africa. Moving upwards into Africa, like Namibia, the Congo, Angola, all of those areas, a lot of them are very much at the bottom. And there are a lot of of the world, then you are just to finish my thought now, uh, I think South Africa has very fertile ground for us to challenge the LNT theory. We have very fertile ground to move up into Africa with the LNT uh, the, um, disposal theory, if I can call it that. And there's a lot of space in Southern Africa for us to go ahead and say, this is what we can bring in. And I think that is very really important. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dia. Yeah, it's very clear. I mean, one of the things that's uh, uh, that we're dealing with, Malcolm, you said very well, it's a communication exercise. Uh, Wade, you said it's education. There's, there's different ways of, of, of bundling the, uh, the conversation. At the end of the day, the, we have a... Uh, Professor Allison, Professor Grimston, do you guys have anything to add to what I just said on South or Southern Africa and what I said about the LNG? We have a wonderful net today. Uh, do you have anything more to add? Uh, you kind of got cut off of that sentence. <laughs> yes, who got cut off? I'm not sure. Can anyone hear me? We have an interesting connection going on. Can anyone hear me? Hello? Could, could I make a point? I, I have not uh, been able to hear uh, everything that you said. Uh, and this, this discussion is clearly uh, will go on for a long time. Uh, there is one point that I tend to disagree with Malcolm, whereas I agree that we will that uh, climate change is going to come along uh, rubbish 
uh, that would be getting smaller and, and local. No, Professor, I agree with you. I believe that there is a common that there is a uh, there is a balance that needs to be taken out. There is both space for big, large nuclear reactors as well as small modular reactors. Um, yes, it, it's kind of like trying to fit big uh, bus tires onto a small VW bug and fitting VW bug tires onto a bus. Both have a, at the place. Uh, in where they need to be. Um, I do have one big question quickly. Um, on an economics point of view, uh, um, we keep talking about people going bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, they started off with 400, 500, 600 megawatts, I'm guessing here. Why haven't they gone right in the beginning to 100, 150 megawatts? Why are we not going smaller? Is there an economic reason not to go smaller? Uh, is it too expensive? Is it too difficult? Or is it just because everybody was like, I want to show you I've got the biggest thing in the world? Well, I think that's very important when you come to fusion, because we've no idea how to make a few small fusion reactor. We should get nuclear reactors. The the uh that that are, in fact, the what's the name? Um, the small nuclear reactor, pressurized water reactor. Uh, people um ha have got approval for their uh um uh design in the U.S. at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was based on a quite established. South Africa was was the centre of the focus into the uh, pebble modular reactor, which yeah. was based on some quite well established Siemens uh, technology. British Nuclear Fields, the UK was involved in several other, and so far every time it's been tried, the economies of scale of bigger reactors have pulled it up from the two three hundred megawatt range. I think the Rolls Royce small modular reactor is four fifty megawatt electrical. I think it's not, you know, by by the standards of uh, the Magnox reactors say these are pretty big reactors. Yeah. Um, and also, that must be the economics. Now, the argument in principle is with smaller reactors, you've got a higher surface to volume ratio. So, passive cooling becomes more uh, feasible in, in accident scenarios. And because they are more nimble, you can switch one or two obviously, during construction. You can have some of them generating electricity without having to wait for the whole project to be finished. And you can... direction, But so far they haven't. So far we've seen a, a vigorous small modular reactors and the research, the research is going into it and it's very exciting, in which case, great. Actually, I'm not sure that I think you can build pretty robust grids. A uh, degree of climate change anyway, as far as I'm aware at the moment, there's no threat, say, to the to the grids in, in Europe or North Africa because of the current uh, heat wave. The grids seem to be standing up pretty well. So, uh, and frankly, you know, the, the revolution in electricity happened when national became a possibility in the 20s. Uh, before that was over and we were just going to export uh, Amory Lovins in, in the mid 70s saying that the day of the big power station was over and we were just going to see small embedded uh, power sources within grids. Um, hasn't really turned out that way half a century later. So uh, maybe there's a, uh, a difference of perspective there between uh, uh, Wade and myself, but that's something that I guess we need to do more research and, and, and learn more about. Well, this. Malcolm, you raise a good point. If you look at the, the way, uh, say, Moscow runs their power system, it's decentralised. They have a lot of gas-fired power stations all over the place, all over Moscow, and they have pipelines running everywhere. And so you could say in that respect, that's what Amory Lovelands was getting to. Is, is the point that 
large nuclear reactors are cost effective because they are large because of LNT. Does LNT drive costs so high that it's better to have very large plants run by complicated safety systems rather than small plants which don't have such, com such complex and costly safety systems like triconics or quadronics that Honeywell have? Interesting question. You, you've got, does the point that uh, of the energy, depending on its texture, half of the energy of a nuclear. Now, in the big one, you pump it all out to sea. You put it up, uh, up in in uh, uh, cooling towers. Now, what we need is to be using those that heat for vertical farming for providing local uh, uh, we are not putting we're not because the people who are building nuclear reactors are not looking at the whole uh, energy needs but just the electric needs we're throwing hard more of the energy. I, I think that reactors should be run 100% of the time and then the off-peak uh, times, which is most of the times uh, during the night and when it's not doesn't need so much electrical power, should be making uh, uh, a uh, hydrogen and running uh, on the basis and local requirements are, but nuclear reactors should be the kernel of industrial developments on the small scale of of uh, towns of a hundred or two hundred thousand people, uh, not bigger and bigger and bigger with longer and longer uh, uh, vulnerable links between uh, cities. Yeah, good, good point, Wade. I think one thing we're seeing with uh, you know, urbanisation is cities are getting bigger. That's that's without a doubt. I I think maybe the uh, this little experiment we've had with COVID will test people's resilience to remain disconnect from some cities. I think it'll just come. It'll happen again. It'll come back again. Uh, and you, we've got like massive cities lining up in Africa in the you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people. I mean, there already are cities greater than 10 million in size. And so massive. sure where I dropped off, but massive power generation systems are going to be uh, necessary, particularly not necessarily just for domestic use, but also industrial use, which will always be at a, you know, at a distal, at a distance from, uh, from, you know, where people live. We can see that happening as well. But the, the future is threshold that that's what we want to want to steer towards. The communication obviously has to be done in a very delicate manner to keep us away from the uh, the dogmatic technical approach that, that Malcolm, you raised has, has been a downfall of industry before. And I think, Wade, the, the key is having the education at the right level uh, so that generations do see uh, that, you know, the benefit. We have a, a, a student guild now of some 50 students who are all nuclear engineers they're very very keen and eager to hear the truth and to absorb data which you know, supports their careers their futures so there's obviously a lot of people just with our in our own group that we have we're very interested in the in what threshold will do for their countries 
And that's something we're, we're planning to do. We have a conference next year in Turkey, and we're going to have a number of speakers. Uh, perhaps we'll invite both of you to attend to speak on this uh, subject. Uh, we see it's a very Turkey's a very good uh, ground, a good place to have that to start that conversation because of the the nanoscent nuclear industry, uh, and because of the potential we have that anything made in Turkey can be exported to Africa. Pretty straightforward. So, uh, yeah, this is this is a key a key agenda item we want to achieve, particularly with the way that linear no threshold has been really adopted for the for good reasons initially. We could say you know, to stop air testing, uh, but then it was just uh, sort of um, sidelined or used for for other purposes. But if we roll back a few years, we go back to the 70s, we can actually use an example of a country that I would say has approached LNT with a little bit of flippancy, as it should do, and that's France. France has you know, major nuclear industry, major production of energy from nuclear. Can anyone talk in the group about what they're doing with uh, a threshold theory. I mean, what's what's their approach? Wade or Malcolm, do you know much about the, the French approach to the threshold? No, no, I don't. Not something we've... They've obviously got something going on there, being at over 70% energy production from nuclear. France, France, France gave a wonderful example of what to do and how to do it and how to get on with it in the 1970s. But they didn't face up to what we're talking about. Uh, and that was then and this is now. And since then, in recent years, France has been dominated much sadly, sadly, by German political opinion. Uh, and well, and um and belgium too and that's very sad indeed i think fortunately the, the physics is taking over i don't know if you can hear me my zoom is having a wonderful time stopping and starting i'm not sure it's bandwidth or something else Looks like I'm frozen for everyone or everyone's frozen for me. Yeah. In particular, fuel cycles and so on. But uh, that's all, all to play for. There's a very important thing we have to watch out for, and that is the difference between uh, enriched uranium and, uh, and high assay, low enriched uranium, which is a... A, a, a piece of political speak for uh, uranium, which somewhere between five percent and twenty percent, uh, and there's big politics in this. And of course, the reason that a submarine can work with a small nuclear reactor is because it uses uh, high enriched uranium, which is not available in the civil uh, in civil civil industry. And this high assay, low enriched uranium is something that I think the Americans are going to try to keep their, uh, their hands on. And the liberation of the uh, level of enrichment is going to be very important because the more enriched the uranium is, the smaller the reactor can be built simply because the neutrons are more uh, concentrated uh, 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 and the reaction is more intense. So, uh, that's something we've got to watch about. Um, and there's a lot of shenanigans going on behind the scenes, I think. Can I ask a question or make a comment? Um, the, uh, two big questions, uh, Professor. Uh, what was the reason behind the 20% threshold for enriched uranium? And the second question, more common, is that with this heat wave, the Ukraine uh, conflict, uh, 
Fukushima, all of that. One thing I think a lot of the nuclear people don't realize is that it also it has some advantages in that we are showing, it is showing the world the economic benefits of nuclear energy. Germany has gone against nuclear, and we've seen where we're going at the moment. Japan has gone against it, and now they're also reversing themselves and they're switching, I think, nine new nu nine reactors again. So from an economics point of view, we've got to look at the, the positives of this last 11-year uh, spell from Fukushima to today. Uh, but back to my question on the uranium, on the 20%, do you know what the original foundation was of why they set the limit at 20%, not 25 or 30 or 15%? Uh, I don't know. The limitation of the uranium was just to do with non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, and I don't think there's any, nobody, not me, uh, there's no reason to suppose that highly enriched uranium, that is to say above 20%, that, that I don't believe there's any case for that. But the difference between 5% and 20% is going to make a lot of difference to the viability of many of the small reactors. I mean, many of the small reactors being proposed in the United States at the moment won't work unless the 5% is raised to 20%. Yeah, I guess it comes up to my next question, which is what is stopping the world from adopting a middle ground between the threshold of 20% and highly enriched uranium. I believe weapons grade uranium is somewhere in the region of about 90 to 95%. Yeah. Why can't we go somewhere in the middle? So arguments like 50% and I'm just throwing out a well, number here. I think 20% is meant to be in the middle. Uh, so at, at the present, well, between 5%, which is the normal, uh, uh, in which the uranium for, used in most reactors and and 97% for, uh, for for nuclear weapons. So 20% was meant to be safely in the middle of that. It depends on the geometry of the reactor, in fact. Uh, but I think the f stepping up by a factor of four makes a lot of difference. Of course, can-do reactors work with natural uranium. So you don't have to have this, but it affects uh, how the reactor is constructed. Okay, thank you that, for that, Wade, uh, Diane. So, I think from the point of view of a uh, you know, threshold for a future, uh, we've covered the, the aspects of how it came about. We've come up, covered the aspects of what we would have to do to get us through where we are now. There actually is a wave, a nuclear wave happening, so we'll ride that. That's great. And I think we, we have to start pointing out our, our, our surfboards, keeping that analogy going, at the appropriate uh, targets or beaches that we'd like to, to land on. And I think Africa is that, is that location. Uh, and it's because of the, the dire need for energy over the next 30 years that makes it obvious that that's where we've got to be. Uh, China is doing a very good job in uh, Asia, and they'll, they'll continue to do that. And we want to make sure that the, the same sort of uh, fluidity of energy transfer happens in Africa as well. So do we have any final words or final comments, Malcolm, Wade, or from anyone in the, in the group that would like to, to contribute at the moment? I can think of. I think, Malcolm, a question for you, probably Wade as well, because you're both from the UK. What will we have to do to get UK to adopt threshold management, threshold radiation management? Wait 50 years? It's, it's actually not that big a barrier here, I think, um, because the, you know, the political establishment is, is in favour of nuclear. 
the public finances are in a mess, but there is a new model of financing coming around which looks more uh, feasible than the Hinkley C model, a regulated asset based model. We need to move very quickly on size world B to go, uh, size world C rather, to get the advantages of the project. They can just move the Hinkley project up to Suffolk. And there's a, uh, there's a Welsh, the Welsh Affairs Committee at the moment looking seriously at Wilver and, and producing a report on whether uh, the next one after that should be in North Wales. Uh, obviously, the position of the Chinese is the Chinese were major funders of Hinkley and Sizewell and were supposed to be taking the financial lead around a new plant at Bradwell based on the Hualong, the new Hualong reactor. Uh, international politics are making that more difficult at the moment. But I think the, I, I'm not sure that LNT is actually a direct barrier at the moment in the UK. It would be helpful, but since we're buying, you know, in effect, we're replicating designs that are already there then I don't think abolishing LNT would lead to a major redesign of the of the Hinkley uh, plant. And if it, and I'm not convinced it would be a good thing if it did, because the industry is always playing around with these designs rather than just duplicating them once they've actually built one. So I, it, I don't think it's a major barrier in the UK at the moment. It would be great if we did move in the right direction on this, but it doesn't seem to me to be the main uh, obstacle to further development here at the moment. It sounds like then it might be an easy win if we were going to remove LNT. We, we did it in an easy place, if, if, it's a, if that's the right word. In the UK, we could use that as a test bed for other countries. The fact that we actually had it removed in, L, in the UK, we wouldn't actually care. We wouldn't actually be using that in the UK, well, the except danger, using it as a use case the for other countries. Is that it would create a public opportunity the anti-nuclear movement which has really been under the cosh in the uk nobody's interested in the anti-nuclear movement in the uk at the mm -hmm. moment and there is a danger that this would give them a a, a, a uh, particularly i say in the in the context where there are some major uh, regulatory issues particularly around uh, grenfell the grenfell tower the the grenfell inquiry has taken its last evidence uh, in the last couple of weeks it will be producing its report soon and it will basically say regulation was nowhere near fit for purpose. Uh, and it'll be right in saying that, be absolutely right in saying that. Uh, and uh, that's not necessarily the time where it made most sensible when there is just no debate around. There's no real debate around nuclear in the UK at the moment. It's the, the, the so we'd be, serious we'd be the out there. Um, and it yeah. would just give them a weapon to say, oh, we told you all along this, you can't just nuclear, they're trying to wriggle out of their regulatory requirements. So I would be tempted to let this particular sleeping dog lie in the UK. Yes. Yes. Better better to go for a for a country that has no nuclear industry and say, look, this is, these are the rules you should adopt here. Uh, this is to lead you and then not actually have the discussion at all about removing regulations. Kind of like uh, I hear what you're saying, Malcolm, like what uh, has happened with the diesel industry, the diesel car industry in Europe, with what, you know, Volkswagen or Audi, et cetera, were doing by circumventing regulations fraudulently. Uh, Yes, another I, I hear what you're saying. There's, there's a whole culture, a whole regulation. Yep, yep, yeah. Good point. That, that validates going after virgin territory. All right, Wade. Did you want to say something? I saw you. Yeah, I just just wanted to say Nothing. that one of the, the effects of LNT are one on the the uh, the cost and design, uh, and that takes longer to change. Uh, but there's also the question of the time required to get planning permission and agreement and so on. Now, given the atmosphere in the UK at the moment, I expect that some things are going to move faster uh, than they have in the recent past. I mean, uh, those of you outside they should not worry about what's going on in the Conservative Party at the moment. That's all pro-nuclear anyway. I don't, or oh, Malcolm may, may uh, have information that I don't, but there's not a, that's not a, that's not part of this problem. Um, but the time required to get permission 
for things to happen uh, is probably mm. a softer target than LNT itself. Yeah, good point. Good point. All right. Okay. So we've we've been going for just under two hours. Uh, would we like to add any more to the to the conversation, or shall we wrap it up? Feels like we're done for today. Yeah, good timing. Good timing. All right, everyone. Well, look, Malcolm, Wade, participants, everyone who's joined, Diane, thank you very much for, for coming in today. Uh, I don't know how we'll go with uh, with putting the recording. In. My connection seems to be fine, so something to do with the recording was playing up. Anyway, thank you very much for participating. We'll uh, we'll get this up on the on the web, and we'll be in a couple of days, and we'll uh, share it out there for the world to see. Uh, can I just ask one thing from Prof. Allison? Can you share your uh, what you wrote, what you presented today? You said you're going to write this document or article or something. Can you perhaps share that with us? I'm, I'm thinking in the next few days about, well, I want to polish it because I wanted to see how people reacted today, polishing it, and the question will be, where to try and submit it, which waste paper basket is it going to end? <laughs> going to end up in. Um, uh, but I'll be having a go at, uh, at that. But to have a, a chance of getting it, one has to say this has not been published on the internet. So I won't be pasting it up until I've lost all hope of uh, getting it uh, into the media. Um, but that happens. But it won't. It won't go dead on you. I promise you. Thank you. I look forward to reading it. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Well, on, the, on that note, uh, I just to say thank you again for participating, and uh, we'll look forward to having another cons another conversation like this in the near future. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.